Hello and welcome to Rejected Religion Spotlight. Today's guest is Karen Swartz, and Karen is a PhD candidate at. Let me see if I can say it correctly. Abu Academy University in Finland. Did I say that all right? It's fine. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I don't. I don't speak. <laughs> I'm sorry. My, my accent is probably <laughs> horrible. But... No. Try not to butcher it. Um, and uh, let me continue. Uh, Karen's research uh, concerns storytelling and sense making in the anthroposophical society. So, welcome, Karen, to Spotlight. I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm really excited to be here. So, thank you very much. I'm so happy that it's working out today. We uh, tried this last week, and the internet said no, not going to happen. So we're back today and everything seems to be going great. And I hope it stays that way. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So great. Okay. Um, yes. So you're going to be sharing a, what seems to be a very interesting case study. This is all going to be new to my ears today. Uh, but before we get into that case study, and just to make sure that everybody is up to speed on today's topic, I thought it might be good to start out by uh, talking a little bit about the Anthroposophical Society itself, what it's about. And so if you could uh, give a little brief uh, introduction into the group and also um, how it has influenced uh, societies across the world, because uh, I, maybe people don't realize the the connections to the anthroposophical society in 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 modern day times with other uh, institutions and organizations. So, if you could talk a little bit more about that, I would love it. <laughs> uh, yeah. So this is um, this is always a very scary question. Like like even though that I know it's I know it's coming, but it's it's a really scary question because it, it's one of those things that's super hard to pin down. Um, and it's going to sound like a lecture disguised as as an answer to your question, um, but um, yeah, I mean it's it's really difficult to just say this is what anthroposophy is. Um, but well, the Anthroposophical Society was founded uh, by the I, I call him the Austrian esoteric entrepreneur Rudolf Steiner. And um, it is based on um, his, yeah, his teachings, which are recorded in, um, in books that he authored himself and revised several times, but also like hundreds and hundreds of volumes of transcribed lectures that he gave during his lifetime. And so this is what makes it so hard to, to just be like, that's what anthroposophy is. But we could say that, um, I guess, if we could talk about ingredients that make it up, that okay. we could say, yeah, that there's this, there's an idea that there is a spiritual world, and what happens here, um, you know, in, in my little, oh, well, you can't really see anything except what you want a picture, <laughs> but you know, in, in my in my very sparsely furnished. Danish home. Like what happens here is a reflex of things that are happening in the spiritual world. So we have that. Um, then there's also uh, ideas about human evolution. And uh, these ideas are informed by a particular, like an anthroposophical way of understanding karma and reincarnation. So another uh, ingredient would be uh, a whole array of spiritual beings um, and the idea that uh, we are more than just our bodies. Um, and, you know, in some of this, oh, we can see there's a family resemblance to theosophy 
And that is not particularly strange because Rudolf Steiner started his career um, within the, uh, the Theosophical Society right. before, mm-hmm. yeah, before leaving it. And, um, but th- there are some differences and, um, by, for example, uh, he had a very, uh, I would say, particular way of um, viewing uh, Christ um, and Christ's purpose. And uh, also there's some kind of a, like I call it a touch of apocalypticism that we, we see also mm. in, in anthroposophy. So, um you know, so there's all this, but uh, there's also you know, some kind of a path that Steiner outlines in his writings. And the idea is that if we follow this particular path, which is comprised of a, a different meditation exercises, that we can develop uh, some kind of clairvoyance. And so, you know, he outlines this path um, or I guess I would say like frames it in kind of a democratic way by saying that like we can all do it. If you just do this, then you will attain this result. But it seems that's not quite the case because within the anthroposophical discourse, it's usually like Dr. Steiner is the only one that has managed to, to attain that level at this point. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> so that complicates things. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, but it also makes things much more, uh, in, in one sense, like more interesting from, mm. from, if you're looking at it from a power perspective yeah. or, you know, yeah. So it's an authority is quite, mm. quite interesting. But um, as far as the influence on um, society and societies, um, I, I would say, um, significant here is the practical side of anthroposophy uh, that um, he uh, Rudolf Steiner together with um, countless collaborators uh, set up or set in motion uh, different practical institutions that were based on anthroposophy and we have uh, for instance uh, Waldorf uh, Waldorf education mm-hmm. uh, just, yeah Um, biodynamic agriculture, um, a particular way of doing curative therapy for adults and children with special needs. And so, and anthroposophical medicine. So, and some of these things have sort of seeped into mainstream culture. So it's had a very wide, wide effect outside of a, a circle of people interested in just in anthroposophy. Right. It seems to be a comprehensive uh, approach, very holistic um, yeah. diet, exercise, um, uh, contact with nature. All of these different elements are they, they seem to be just a part of the the whole package, if you if you will. Yeah. So yeah. but yeah, I think that I, I don't know if a lot of people know that the Waldorf schools uh, is a product of uh, anthroposophical society and, and Rudolf Steiner's uh, ideas. Uh, I know for for myself, I had heard of of Waldorf schools, but didn't have any mm-hmm. type of connection there. So I thought that yeah. might be interesting to to uh, to mention that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that, that there's a, I think a lot of times that people, you know, just in general, people don't realize the effects that esotericism have had mm. on culture because it's yeah. it's it is kind of just in the background and not really spoken about, just out in the open. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I just find that just, those little interesting fun facts. So I think yes, that's, that's <laughs> yeah, me too. Good to yeah. know. Good to know. Yeah. So. Your case study focuses on the topic of women and their positions of authority. And we had just mentioned about interesting aspects, how um, how these goals that you would want to achieve, that not everybody could achieve these goals, but but Steiner did. Uh, so uh, in, in kind of in that light, uh, these women, uh, and in particular, you focus on three, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, these women have uh, played an important part in the history of the group, or at least two of them have. And 
I'm very curious to hear about the the story of about how the authority of two of these women have been accepted, but the authority of the third has not really been accepted. Uh, so could you elaborate on what happened with these women? <laughs> um, okay, yeah, I will, I will preface this by saying that uh, this project is something, it's like the, the contours are sort of, woo, you know, the... the <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so I'm sort of, uh, it's a work very much a work in progress, okay. but I, I can at least sort of like frame this sure, um, or at least talk, yeah, I'll talk about what, what my interest is and what my aim is. And so if I, if I do that, I I'll back up a little bit and talk just very briefly about like my, my own research that I have for my, uh, my PhD project. Please do. But, yeah. So, I mean, it's just, <laughs> this isn't like an, like an advertisement. It's just <laughs> sort of like a, a little, a backstory that, yeah. um, I, yeah. So I, I have, uh, researched, uh, um, uh, mostly the, the Anthroposophical Society in Sweden. And, um, so if for, for this project, I did quite a bit of field work that I, I carried out, I don't know, something like 45 interviews or something like that. And I I went and I visited about 50 different anthroposophical institutions in Sweden because there's quite a few. And one thing that I noticed when I would visit these places and I would talk to various people who worked there, their representatives, and they would tell me about the history of anthroposophy in Sweden, they would keep mentioning like the the five same people over and over and over as sort of pioneering figures, mm-hmm. and so like the the same five guys over and over and over, and so but but then like the longer I would be at a place, uh, the more it would become apparent that the very backbone of many of these institutions were women. Um, and so you know, in it was quite interesting. And so I, this is something that I also see mirrored in the history of the Anthroposophical Society as a, a larger worldwide organization. So, um, so that's where the, this interest came from. So when it comes to Rudolf Steiner and his many, many projects, um, it would kind of w- work like this, where, you know, this is just a, a very, it's sort of like a cheap generalization, but I think it gives a picture. So somebody would come to him and be like, okay, I would like to start, a, you know, a, a system of, I, I don't know, education. And so he'd be like, okay, great do that. And then, you know, it maybe he'd like say some stuff, maybe he'd give a few lectures and then he'd go away and everybody else would do all the work. So it, it was almost like this, like Kim Jong un approach of like point to something. And, and then he gets all the cred, but like everybody else that actually made this happen, it you know, is sort of, you know, fade into the background uh, so Steiner had during his lifetime, um, his career within the Anthroposophical Society, had countless collaborators, and many of them were women. Yeah, he would get an idea, and then somebody else would, you know, execute like ninety percent of whatever it was to bring this project into being. Okay. Yeah, and, and so he was sort of. Um, <laughs> it almost feels strange to talk about him in this way uh, because I, when, when so many of us, we see these pictures of him and he, he looks a little bit like um, I get Bella Lugosi or like, like, like some <laughs> super stern, serious person, but he was a bit of a sex bomb. Uh, <laughs> like in, <laughs> yeah, in, in his own way. Um, and so he, he would develop you know, he, like a series of sort of very passionate relationships with very creative women. 
Um, and so, you know, I, I think, for instance, of, of course, his second wife, uh, Marie von Sievers, who um, was absolutely fundamental in uh, the creation of Eurythmy, the anthroposophic you know, art of yeah. Eurythmy. Um, but it's still, it, it's very much written as if this was like Steiner's creation and she just kind of helped out. Was that it deliberate, was, do you think, on, on Steiner's part? Or did um, it just kind of happen that way? That, like, did his the, wife not really come forward and talk about, you know, this is what I did or this is what I developed or that you know in speaking more in terms of what she did herself was she just kind of just always in the background and just letting him be at the podium and and speaking and and or, or, or whatever you know taking the taking the lead so i i think see my interest has been more in how things are remembered later um, oh, by by exactly sort of like the a construction like, like an organizational story, a construction of a narrative right, about these right. people, how, yeah, how they are remembered. But it, it, it seems to be that if somebody was content to play the role of his assistant, everything's fine. But, you know, if there was a collaborator that... Uh, I showed more of sort of like agency in some way, then that that's definitely not okay. And mm -hmm. that's when the uh, various problems start. I see. So, so you have a very enigmatic character in, hmm? in Steiner. He, he, he liked the attention. The, yeah. I mean, he was, he was extremely, he was a little bit like a rock star because uh, he, he would, yeah. I mean, he had the kind of schedule where it, if you look at, um, I, I think in one way, it, it's no wonder that he, he got sick and died quite young because I, it's almost like he literally worked himself mm. to death. Because he was, you know, always on the way somewhere or this or, you know, he would give hundreds and hundreds of lectures a year. Sometimes he was doing different courses concurrently. And then afterwards, like he would travel somewhere, let's say. Uh, let's say he went to Prague and was giving some cycle of lectures. So he would lecture. And then afterwards, there would be a ginormous line of people waiting to see him afterwards to, to ask him questions. Mm -hmm. So, so it could be a combination of both the rock star quality and that element of, you know, he, he needed to be there in person because everybody wanted to see him and hear him and hear what he had to say. But it could also be that, you know, he was a hard worker. It sounds like he was a very dedicated person to yeah. what he believed in and that he probably did have a lot of ideas that he knew that he probably couldn't do just all on his own and he needed other people. Yeah, exactly. Because I, I don't mean to uh, uh, cheapen, you know, no, or to not. sort of like, yeah, to a minute, I guess I realize it might sound like, <laughs> like I was <laughs> doing that, but yeah, absolutely not trying to minimize or marginalize what this man did because it's absolutely astounding. So, and it would have been impossible to, <laughs> to right. do all this without, anybody's help mm -hmm. um, okay but, so so we could say that he delegated a lot of a lot of tasks to to other people and and you found uh in your research that a lot of these other people were women yes and so his second wife was very uh very involved uh you also mentioned in your abstract that there was another woman named by the name of Ida Viegman is Ita. what they would say yeah. Ita, um, okay. Yeah. Thank you for correcting me. <laughs> he collaborated with um, anthroposophical medicine. Okay. So Ito was yeah. more in the medicine area of, uh, yeah. of anthroposophy. Okay. All right. Yeah. And uh, Edith Merriam, who I also wrote about in that abstract, that uh, she was a, a British artist. 
Okay. And and also collaborated with him uh, in the uh, latter decade, the latter years of his life. She uh, died tragically very young. I I've been interested in sort of like how they're remembered, how they're talked about. I see. Um, yeah, yeah, and and it's more that that they're sort of talked about like assistance in some way, and so like I, I'm thinking, for instance, in the case of Marie Steiner, uh, she would make like when he went on tour, shall we say, that she was the one that took care of all the arrangements. <laughs> so he, yeah, so right. he just kind of went exactly, and and of course, I mean that was tough work to. Is I think about how poorly the train systems function nowadays. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I, I'm not thinking that was you know a whole lot of fun to to travel through Europe on a yeah, train back right. then I, I, on that kind of a schedule. Yeah. But yeah, so it's, so it's like if they're playing some sort of role of like caretaking of like taking care of him and fixing this and fixing that then they tend to be regarded in a more positive light as some sort of helping angel in some kind of way okay and when you dig a little bit and you start to see that they actually did a whole heck of a lot of work that it wasn't, they weren't just like his personal secretaries or you know, helping with, you know, mm-hmm. this little thing and that little thing. But what makes the more, I guess we could say the more modern figure that I bring up, uh, Judith Van Halle. Yes. Um, yes. What makes her different is that instead of playing some sort of assistant role, um, she claims to have her own independent insights. Okay. And these other um, women didn't didn't make any t- any such claims. Not in the same way, because they're seen as sort of exactly that their function is to support him. I see. But with uh, Judith von Haller. Like Steiner, of the, of course, you know he's been dead for years and years and years. The, she was born in the '60s. Okay. Um, yeah, and so she uh, she's German. Um, she was born in the '60s, and uh, an architect, and had been active in anthroposophical circles for uh, for quite a while. And, and then, sort of like almost like Steiner does, like she kind of breaks out and becomes her own. Like as open air, as esoteric entrepreneur, <laughs> yes, tongue twister. Um, <laughs> yeah, I should be able to say this by now, but she, yeah, so she like breaks out. She becomes her own entrepreneur and her own like uh, charismatic leader, and sort of gets her own little group of um, disciples, mm. for for lack of a, a better term, and claims to um, have her own like, visions into this spiritual world. And rather than saying that, like, you know, yes, I, I must be doing, I, I must be on the right path because I'm seeing what Rudolf Steiner saw. It's like she almost sort of, like, turns that around and uses him to, like, confirm her own visions i see and is this received well the the, it it was i would say no i think it would be the easy answer no (laughs) exactly (laughs) that there there was um yeah there were a lot of conflicts that there has been some sort of reconciliation uh, like within the but between i would say like mainstream anthroposophical circles and her own there were it was not pretty right there there were um, right quite a bit of conflicts so what what was going on with judith that was so different from uh from what the other women were were doing 
kind of behind the scenes. They were doing their, their own important work, but not really getting a lot of recognition. It sounds like Judith was getting a lot of recognition in, in smaller circles, perhaps, but there were, there seemed to be very extraordinary things happening with her that from what I understand was not, there, these were not, these things were not happening with the other women that you were referring to earlier. Well, I think it, it was a, a claiming, um, because I, I think in the the other women, the earlier ones, mm-hmm. that they're not really making a claim to authority in okay. some okay. sense. Yeah, uh, but she is. I see. So uh, this, this yeah. would then relate to what you mentioned, uh, the term proximal authority that uh, Dr. Manon Hedenborg-White uses in her own research, her own work. But um, I think maybe we could talk a little bit about this. So you're, you're speaking of what is this referring to? Let's just talk about the the term itself. What is it referring to and Mm -hmm. how, how is this playing out then with, uh, with regard to uh, Judith? So Proximal authority um, that, in a nutshell, mm-hmm. <laughs> if, if I would just say, explain it quickly based on my understanding, it has to do with that um, if you're involved in you know, some kind of a, a group, that um, you yourself can get quite a bit of power if you're close to the charismatic leader. Right. You know, however... Um, it, it, you know, it, it's very unstable that that because it's completely it's dependent upon your relationship with that person, and there's you know it's if you're up at the top, it's there's a long way down to fall. Right. So, did uh, Marie and Ita did they have uh, what would you consider them having a proximal authority? The yes. So their relationships with him, if we see them as sort of like a series, mm-hmm. okay, you know, that, you know, he's like tight with one for a while and then she falls when another one comes in. So it's like sort of this, uh, it functions in that way. Right. Yeah. I, yeah, I see a lot of parallels with uh, Alistair Crowley and the, the uh, Scarlet Women, because re- yeah. we mentioned uh, Manon and her work, her research is looking into those women who, uh, and, and re- again, regarding her term, proximal authority, the women that were uh, closest to uh, Crowley at that point had a lot of influence. So in this case, with uh, with Steiner and his important ladies <laughs> that he was involved yeah, yeah, with, yeah. That the same could apply. We could... We could say this, but for yes. Judith, she didn't know Steiner personally. She did not have any relationship with him. Correct. Because, that is correct okay. because yeah, he was he was dead several. Okay, uh, and see, this is where it gets tricky, and this is when we look at this perspective that I I see it. You know, I I see I see how it plays out very clearly in the cases of you know the these women that met him during his lifetime what i've been trying to do is to see because i still feel in some way that it applies to judith van halle even though he died like decades before she was even born because to some degree that rudolf steiner i i see him as like, if i see the anthroposophical society as an organization like a straight up organization that I see him as like the long dead CEO of yeah of the anthroposophical society who is in some way still the the key person like in, in how things are run and how things are done right he's always referred to yeah, exactly. And so when she starts out her, because it is possible as a woman to have a position of authority 
within the anthroposophical society. Um, but the second you sort of like move away from what Rudolf Steiner said and start to have your own ideas about how things are, that's when I the see. trouble begins. Right. So how yeah. was, could you give an, a, 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 an example of how Judith was calling upon the authority of Steiner, even though she hadn't really known him? The, the, for instance, if she's is in, she's written quite a bit. Mm-hmm. And so it, in her writings, she'll um, outline like her, her insights mm-hmm. into the spiritual world and the, the history of, you know, all that is and everything that's happened. And so she'll sometimes evoke his name uh, and, as almost a way of like confirming her own okay. visions. I see. Yeah. So uh, I, I kind of hinted at this before that there were some extraordinary things happening uh, with her. You say that she's, uh, she gets, uh, has insights and visions, but uh, you also mentioned that she has uh, stigmata. Yeah, exactly. And there was something else with, uh, what was it? Uh, oh, Inedia. That she, yeah. So yeah, in yeah. common terms, uh, that she just lives on her breath on the air, breatharianism, yeah. I guess you could call it. So these are are these concepts and and practices that uh, and and phenomena that that are associated normally with anthroposophical society. No, um, that okay. it, it's, it's stuff that um, like a Steiner himself for has written about stigmata mm-hmm. uh, and is that he's pretty much had something to say about everything that you can have something to say about and so yeah I and mean, so he says various things about stigmata and that um in in one sense that it's it's a sign that somebody's spiritual development isn't as it should be but but then there's other places where he says the opposite because this is like a, a very like a, a typical, uh, typical thing uh, right. with Steiner as well. That that I mean, when but also I mean, if you have like thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of stuff, I mean, you can pretty much find contradictions. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, and it winds okay. up being like you know, if you don't, if you asked mom and she said no then, you know, go ahead and ask dad. Right. Uh, okay, so in Judith's case, she has uh, the phenomena of stigmata. And yes. how is that then viewed? Uh, and so this is one thing that has become a, a point of contention because it's been a way to sort of undermine her, her claims because um, it, people within the Anthroposophical Society are critical of her, have then gone and referred to these you know, things that Steiner has said about it being sort of a sign that things aren't what they should be. Right. Yeah. And then people that want to defend her then go and find the other, the other. you know, right. yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. So it's, it is quite, it's quite interesting. I see. So is, is it a case that she has, uh, you mentioned that she has a small following is is that this how things are at the moment and how they're probably going to remain? Or is she still trying to um, reach out to other members of the society and, and get them on board? Or is that really not her goal? I mean, could you t- talk a little bit more about, um, I guess, her purpose, if she's ever said anything regarding that? Um, well, as far as I understand that she's become like, harder and harder to, uh, um, keep track of, oh. I, I guess to kind of like come away, away from public. Okay. Um, but I mean, she's still like, she's still, um, uh, communicating her teachings. Uh, she wrote about the Corona, the COVID virus for instance. So, I mean, she's still active, mm-hmm. um, 
but my understanding is that within uh, recent recent times, there's been some kind of a, like move towards reconciliation. Okay. Um, her and the representatives for what I would call mainstream mm. anthroposophy. Because you were looking at the way people are uh, received, the reception yeah. of, of these people. So can you talk more about that discourse about her? Sometimes it can be, it can be a bit different. It's very polemical. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's, some of it is quite harsh. Um, it's very much time has been spent trying to undermine her claims. Um, She is sometimes sexualized, uh, which is also quite interesting. How, how, how so? Uh, uh, People talking about her appearance. Oh, Um, yeah. Uh, With regards to uh, uh, being a woman, she's critiqued just for how she looks how she dresses, her hair, yeah, exactly. everything like that. Just mundane things like that. Yeah, it, it, precisely, <laughs> which is quite interesting. Yeah, and so it's right. I it, it's not really, I guess it's kind of sad that it's not really surprising. Mm. <laughs> but it just well, there, mirrors. Is a, there is a definite difference in the way men and women are, are viewed and received and and yeah. the way criticism is applied to men and women, yeah, and just I mean yeah. you could get in, just into general uh, questions about it, just in pop culture, people actresses are being interviewed about things that they get questions that men would never get, you know that this yeah. it's, it's oh, yeah. very very strange. So I guess it's not an odd thing that women in esotericism would have the same type of challenges. My goal is to do a much larger project on this. Okay. Yeah. That was going to be one of my questions. If you were planning on, (laughs) on expanding your, uh, your work in this area, if you're going to be writing about it or doing more research about it. Because it is very much sort of like, this is, we, we could say it in one, we could say in one sense, this is a byproduct Mm-hmm. of re- research I've done for my PhD. I, I do. I think this is a, an area that is so sadly, sadly, sadly under-researched is women in anthroposophy. Mm. And so, so is yeah. Judith an exception to the rule or of the norm of the attitudes within the society about the way they view women now? I mean, as far as proximal authority is concerned, do women still have these challenges of of not being able to uh, progress and, and take leadership roles? Or is that really not an issue anymore? No, I, I think because this is, um, I, I would say with this Judith situation, this is recent history. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but as... Um, is if I, I think of the way that the anthroposophical society is built up, that it has a governing council, you know, with people that you know, represent, and it is very possible to be a woman and you know, and have a, a position within that council. Mm-hmm. But what I argue is it's within obviously like quite tight framework. That there's only so far you can go uh, from what Steiner said. So the boundaries are quite strict. Yes, I think the boundaries are quite exactly. And I argue that if you're a man, and and this sounds like I'm making huge generalization here, but it, it seems like if you're a man, that you are you are allowed to a, a wider latitude. We could hmm. say, you know, because one of the people that was her mo- one of her most ferocious critics also had his own independent visions. Hmm. What was his name or what is his uh, name? That he passed away, but Sergei Prokofiev uh, was his name. Okay. But he, yeah, um, so he had a leadership position. 
I see. Within the, yeah. And so um, there were also um, people within the anthroposophical world that questioned his insights, but he, I argue, was not treated the same way that Judith is. Why do you think that is? It, this phenomenon with it that there's a different way of treating women than men. Do you have any ideas on that? Why do you think this? It seems to be a bit uh, antiquated, but why do you think that is? No, well, I I think it's because things haven't changed as much as we we like to tell ourselves mm-hmm. they have. Because I I think if I take a very mundane example from my own life, um, that um, by my husband is Professor Olaf Hammer, and when we work on a project together, for instance, because the way we we have a lot of fun working together, so we collaborate quite a bit, and even if we have made it to, you know, whoever the party concerned is, we've made it abundantly clear that the project is like 90% mine and he's just kind of on board. So emails about this project will be sent to him. His name will appear first. Um, Again and again and again. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, this is, uh, now that you mentioned this, this is not a uh, a new, <laughs> this, this doesn't <laughs> surprise me, let, let's put it like that. It is unfortunate that women are still in that position. And I yeah. guess I have this maybe an idealistic Pollyanna-ish type of, uh, I guess my, my hope is that, you know, now that we are more... Uh, aligned with ideas of, you know, equality and we don't want to discriminate and things like that, that that's not really the, the, the reality of, of the world, even though we would like it to be that way. And that is really unfortunate that, that this is still happening and it happens everywhere. So it's, it's, it happens in academia, it happens in uh, esoteric societies. I'm sure it happens. Oh yeah everywhere uh and that's yeah that's rather disheartening yeah um that it's that it is that way uh so in this case i guess judith isn't an exception to the rule because it's this is this how things have been uh how things have been going and they're yeah. still going this way for her yeah is that what what i see um with with these women is because I've been looking at it from from a couple different things. That if if I look at it from like what happened historically, and with me myself, like I'm just becoming acquainted with this, so I only know like broad strokes. Mm-hmm. But so basically, you know, these women come in like successive. So so he's with one, and then he finds somebody else and becomes attached. And then the relationship with the first one starts to sour a bit. But the way then that they're talked about afterwards, they're almost in many ways spoken about like, you know, his his sweet little assistants. In the case I know more um, comprehensively in the Swedish case, they're often described as these like angels in the household hmm. of like the, these women that like in that really and truly you know, were pioneers and you know, rolled up their sleeves and um, did more work than I could manage to do. Um, they're spoken about as just sort of these little almost etheric beings, the like angels in the household, in the background, while the great men are the ones that. The, and this the, is still the case. Of uh, yeah, it's it's quite interesting. Yeah, 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 exactly. Because I I would go to a place and and it, like I said, it's these same like four or five men that I, and they did a lot. Of course they did, 
but you hear about them over and over and over and over. And then go visit an institution and they would say, oh, it was, it was this place was founded by one of these guys that you've heard about 9,000 times. But then when you start asking more questions and go around, then you hear about, like, I'll just make up somebody's name. But then, you, you know, you hear about Ethel, you know, who, like, did 90% of the work to Hmm. get that place up and running and keep it going and was some sort of like matriarch over the whole. I see. And yet the, and yet that important function and role that that woman fulfilled is not acknowledged unless you really start nagging them about, about what's really happening behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah, it's quite you know it's it's quite interesting. Is that the anthroposophy has a, a long history in Sweden, and the institutions started being um, established there in the 1930s. And so you know a lot of those people were women who did mm-hmm. you know yeah. it, it's who who make like what I do in a normal day look like nothing. I see. Okay. Yeah. So it's also outside of the anthroposophical society that people are talking about her. Yeah. During a period of time. Yes. Okay. And when was this period of time? that? I, I don't recall. I mean, I would say like within Within the past ten years, okay, so fr- uh, fairly recent then. The uh, yeah, but yeah, precisely, okay. precisely. Okay, that's interesting. So is she then kind of sketched in a in a in a way that it, that they're talking about her as if she's some kind of nut nutcase? Or, yeah, yeah okay. precisely, precisely. That I I think that. Um, the, the second claims are made for stigmata or that, you know, somebody can live for, for years, you know, without ingesting anything. And like, I personally, I'm not saying whether this is possible or not. That's not my interest. Right. Right. But I think such claims, you know, it's, it it does attract attention, which, yeah. Yeah, precisely, yeah. which leads to that. Because I think yeah. a lot of people are incredulous about these, about claims, any type of, really any type of spiritual claim that anybody comes out with. A lot of people are going to be like, yeah, right, whatever. Yeah, well, exactly. But, it it uh, sells. Yeah. yeah. And when these conflicts become, is it, if we think about countries where anthroposophy is much more part of the public sphere, uh, then, you know, these do Stories like this, where there's some kind of a major conflict, mm. you know, it can make its way into what I would call mainstream press. If if we look at this, if we call it the anthroposophical milieu, which mm. would sort of like be all kinds of people, yeah. from people who actually are members of the or- the anthroposophical society to people that uh, you know, are sort of like mildly interested right um her writings appeal more to those who are interested in um steiner's christology so for a very specific uh category of people Um, precisely because i mean there's others that are utterly uninterested in any of You know, yeah, uh, I think she probably has very specific things to say, so it's not a general message for everyone. Yeah, perhaps. precisely. Okay. Yeah, I see. yeah, exactly. So mm-hmm. it sounds like this is uh, another case of a uh, of a person who most likely felt a calling and mm-hmm. wanted to heed that calling and and do the work that they they thought that they needed to do were ridiculed of it uh, about it and then for it because of their gender Hmm. and i guess this is not so surprising in a way but it's (laughs) it's not really very uh encouraging either in that regard exactly that if we sort of cook it down in some way it's like you can do that as long as you play by 
the rules, Mm -hmm. but when you step outside from that and I guess claim your own authority and so, nope. You know, coming back to just the, the topic of esotericism in general, there's so much that, that, that is misunderstood, number mm-hmm. one. And yeah. so I think it's a good thing that, that yeah. this type of, you know, these these subjects are being talked about, even if they're very uncomfortable and, and difficult uh, topics, mm. like, you know, with discrimination uh, and, and, and abuse and things like that. These, yeah. aren't, these aren't the easy things to talk about, but I think they do need uh, addressing and I think they do need yeah. to be, uh, like you say, framed, put into context, mm. differentiated. Yeah. I yeah, think those exactly. are all important things. Uh, yeah. But I think it's a good thing that's that you're that what you're doing and what you're looking at all of these discourses. You're looking at, um, you know, looking into how people think about things, basically. Mm. So I think yeah. that's a great thing. Thank you. These are <laughs> these are areas that are just, I guess you could say they're just kind of obscure, and mm. it's not um, it's not the uh, super popular. You know, everybody wants to to talk about it and know about it. These are these are a little bit, you know, in the in the fringes, I guess you could say. Yeah, but are still having big impacts on people. Yeah, so. and I think that's also an interesting aspect of um, where it, it's almost like there's this idea uh, of like, oh, it's so hidden and secret. And but I mean, if you like, if you type Rudolf Steiner or like Waldorf School, and and spend like two minutes googling, you will find like literally hundreds of lectures. And like more information than you could consume, in, in <laughs> than you would want to consume. So it's all That's out true. there. That's it's true. all there. It's like it's it's completely. Uh, it's all around you, and you don't yeah. see it. Yeah. In a, yeah, in exactly. a way, it's uh, uh, kind of a strange phenomenon because there's so much, <laughs> so much occultism in the world. In the world. Yeah. And people just don't see it, but it's everywhere. If you know what you're looking at, if you know, yeah. that's kind of the, the the strange thing that it's hidden in plain sight. That's what I was looking yeah, for. Yeah, that's exactly. The, that's- well, I want to thank you for talking with me today about uh, about your research and about what's been happening in in your world and and, and how you. you can use your uh, your specialty to help other people. I think that's that's always a good thing and important work. Thank okay. you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I think we're yeah. going to wrap it up for for today. And I enjoyed our discussion. I hope the viewers have also uh, enjoyed it. And uh, I hope you will uh, join uh, join me again next time. And I hope everybody has a great day. See you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you.